tonight to celebrate this day in history. This has historically been a sacred day. A day of purification. A day of truth and vengeance. A day of power and feathers. A day of hell and fury. We mourn not its victims. We honor its victors. For us, the 60s is a decade of corruption. The final culmination of 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian rottenness. The 60s were murdered, but its vestiges remain. We must annihilate its traces, branch and root. We must purge them from our life and from life itself. This is our sacred duty. In closing, I would remind those here that murder is the predator's prerogative. And there is no birth without blood.
with the army of insolence. Fools! You think yourselves capable of understanding, but no, you understand nothing except that which revolves around your own polarized Messiah, your crystalline Christ. Your only motivation in life is to turn on others, though you deny it, but you have been the ones to be deceived. For we can smile knowing full well that you are our slaves, our zombies, our shuffling drones. We realize you are potentially dangerous. When one of us speaks out against your powdered god, your beatific torpor is transformed into boiling rage. Your placidly smirking countenances become masks of stifled hate. We are prepared for your loving bitterness, though, and we understand. We understand that you and all of your wretched kind must be placed in corrals like cattle. In order to protect the undefiled from your brain-blasting evangelism, you who have besmirched the name of everything you touch, you who have blasted the minds of your own young, you have found your life, but in your band of vigilantes abroad, you spent so much time in your ragged cup, searching for more and whiter light, than you have ever looked the darkness, and that master of night is where we stop, throw water to the great well, where all frail secrets are signed, beware! Like a dead burning! You're a smug, 
Church of Satan, and I'm a musician. I've written a few books, and uh, what we did this evening was a ritual. Uh, Anton was saying the other night, he's saying Satanism is coming out of the ritual chamber and into the mainstream, and I think that's what we're doing, trying to bring that message to a, a broader audience. Give me some examples of how it's coming into the mainstream now. Well, me and a lot of the people I know are, are, are spreading the word, and Adam has a has Feral House Press, and he's published some books, and 
and uh, I put out records and records um, uh, in San Francisco how, how many members do you have in your church I'd have no idea I'd have no idea, but we're an elitist organization. We prefer quality rather than quantity. We don't care. We don't want to have big buildings and attract a mass audience. We want an elite, just a few people who are good people who will be able to do what we need to have done. And what other things you need to have done? Well, we need uh, we ha We need to bring about stratification. We need to bring power back to the powerful. We need the slaves to be enslaved again and not be slaving over us, not be ruling over us and dictating the content of our lives. We want to dictate the contents of our lives. We think strength is better than weakness and we want to uh, live our life in that way. Um, describe a little bit about the difference, if you will, between the Church of Satan and some of the crazies that are out there doing things in the name of Satan. Uh, how does that make you people feel? Well, I think the Church of Satan is, is creating real changes. We have people behind the scenes. We have people in high places who are making changes that people aren't even aware of. And these nitwits that just go out and kill people in the name of Satan are serving a purpose in that they're thinning down the population, but they aren't really the kind of Satanists that, that like us. They aren't the sort of people we associate with and the sort of people we respect or look up to. Is this resurgence in Satan just happening in San Francisco? Is it happening all It's happening all over the world. And it's coming, coming about in a lot of different ways. It, it, some people can call it Satanism, but this force that's happening in the world is coming about all over. It's like resurgent atavism. And it's, some people call it Satanism, some people call it by other names, but it's happening all over. And it will happen more and more. Is there an Armageddon coming? I mean, is there a date that you're aiming for? No. No, I think Armageddon came a long time ago. The end of the world came ages ago, but it happened slowly over a period of time and nobody noticed it. It's an ongoing process. The world is, today is different than the world 30 years ago. It's like decayed so much and it's decaying more and more all the time. And as that decay gets worse, we get stronger. And we are rising up as the entire world is sinking down. The entire world is rotten and corrupt, and they're ordaining their own death. They're, to, to us, they're just dead people who refuse to lay down. They're cadavers. Uh, there is an obvious similarity that, uh, between you and uh, your ceremonial and uh, what was in Germany in the 1930s or 1940s. Can you talk a little about that? I mean, what is it in uh, the uh, Nazi, the SS, that appeals to you? Well, for us specifically, it's um, what appeals to us about the SS or the Nazis and what we feel we have in common with it is order, bringing things back to order, bringing, recognizing a natural order in the world that things have to operate according to. You, you, if you work with nature and work in its will, you're, you're all powerful, but if you work against its will, it'll step on you and you'll never get anything accomplished. And to us, this is an obviously, this is an official Church of Satan doctrine, but me personally, um, Hitler was trying to, uh, he was an occultist, trying to bring about a pagan revival. It was completely against the whole Judeo-Christian ethic and he was bringing that to an end and bringing something new forward and I feel that's what we're doing today. This is like the start. This is start the start of a renewal process. It's a purification, and it's it's a natural process. It, we we don't have to do it. We're doing it. We're helping it along. But it's something that's a natural process that would come about on its own, and it is. And the people, the stratification is coming about. The people who are there are rising up and coming into line with us, and the others are just floundering. Thank you. If you could both start off and uh, give me a background on Radio Werewolf, let's start that. Well, Radio Werewolf was founded in 1984 as the uh, manifestation of a certain quality in not the human experience, but what has been understood as the human experience. It's a, it's a quality that people are frightened of, a quality that people are consider evil. And it's something that has been very little understood until now. And in 1984, we consider that the lycanthropic revolution began. 
And since that date, we have summoned up the dark forces in man. We're summoning up the wolf in man. And we're calling on everything that has been forbidden, everything that has been locked up and restrained. And our work is designed to unleash the beast in man once and for all. What will, what, what's the final objective that once you unleash the beast in man? Well, we don't, have, we don't have a linear objective that we could explain to you in a way that you could simply understand. But certainly, our quest is for world domination. In the simplest terms, our quest is for power, power for its own sake, power used to the extreme as it has never been used before. We both individually had this quest and then we bonded together and the power increased. And we find the more people that become involved, the power increases and it gets to be a larger and larger phenomena. As you saw tonight, there are masses of people who are being drawn to this. For the first time, they're coming out of the closet. They've always been around. It's always been the same small percentage. But they're coming out of the closet now and they're exposing themselves and they've always been more powerful than the mortal. We, um, we separate the human race into two species, predator and prey. And that is why we've chosen the wolf imagery as our standard and our symbol. And the rest of humanity is really a very little concern to us. Our main purpose is to create an elite, a power base of masters who will finally remove the, the excrement of Christianity, Judaism, Mohammedanism, all of the traditional slave religions, as Nietzsche called them, and we mean to destroy them by any possible means. This is the first phase in a revolution that will continue into the 21st century. It's, by some people's standards, a demonic revolution, but it, it is the, the liberation of the finest things in man, beauty, strength, wisdom, and everything that has been perhaps condemned as the black arts, as evil. When you say by any possible means, what exactly do you mean by that? Our music is designed to awaken primordial instincts in the human mind. And whatever comes of this is our desire. When we perform music, it's a ritual. It's a very specific ceremony designed to unleash these emotions. We incorporate the dominant frequency. That's a frequency that human beings respond to. It's an ancient frequency that's always been around. Everything breaks down into vibrations, and by controlling that, you can control both matter and thought. And we've investigated this, and we've spent a lot of time, and our music incorporates the dominant frequency in our control of the masses. The masses are only to be controlled. It's either the control they're under now or the one that we bring. And we're, we're living in a dead world at this moment. The world ended a long time ago. Those who fear that the world is going to end are very mistaken because when we look around us on the streets of our rotting metropolises, we see automatons. These people are zombies. They have no spirit. They have no will. And the time has come at last for those of us who still have a will, for those of us who do have a vision of beauty, of strength, and really of a world where the truly demonic possibilities of man can be unleashed once and for all. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you uh, take issue with the media's misconception of the drug craze, satanic. Uh, we represent above all other things order. Order versus chaos. Strength versus weakness. And what's happening right now is a process where the weak are falling off. There's a death wish in the human race that's expressing itself in mass murder, in all sorts of manifestations, and we encourage that. We would like to see most of the human race killed off because it is unworthy. It is unworthy of the gift of life. Is that something that you plan to support, that killing off process, or will it be something that... It's, it's already begun. We're working with natural law. We're working along with natural law. And nature has now decreed that most of man must die. And as I say, we are forming an elite. This is the first step in forming, really, a master race. That's the only term that I can use. Yeah, as I said before, yeah, that's a... What about your music in uh, terms of its control over people's minds? How, how effectively does that work? Well, I'd like to 
sort of explode the myths about much of so-called satanic music. For one thing, backward masking, which frightens so many Christian um, evangelists, really, that is an effective means of mind control. We have utilized the dominant frequency, which we referred to before, which is a certain vibration that when it is responded to in the human mind can unleash these possibilities. And that's what we're interested in. We're, we don't really care if people understand our message. We're not proselytizing, we're not preaching, we're not trying to gather anyone into our fold. These middle class housewives that are worried that we want to abduct their children are barking up the wrong tree because we wouldn't want anything to do with their whole mediocre and corrupt lifestyle. We're building a new world. Yeah, our music has order. The music of today, in most parts, is chaos and noise. And structure and order have always been a part of great music, and that same structure and order go throughout the universe. So the music becomes at one with the universe. We, we are part of the natural order, as are all of the people you've spoken to tonight. We are reflecting what is beautiful in nature. And of course, the irony of that is, is that most ignorant human beings will mistake that as evil. They are frightened of their own possibilities. They're frightened of freedom. And their whole life is lived in fear. And that's why we will be their worst fear, their worst terror, their worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the record that you'll be uh, doing with Anton LaVey. Well, Boyd Rice of Non and myself will be collaborating with Anton LaVey on a recording project where he will be performing various invocations the Electroshef War Spiel from the Satanic Rituals, um, a piece from H.P. Lovecraft entitled Psycho Pompos. And of course, H.P. Lovecraft is one of, the, one of the minds who influenced us most. His understanding of the darker regions of life has been a great inspiration to us. But this will be the first recording that Anton LaVey has done in 20 years since the Satanic Mass. And it's sort of a symbolic recognition that there is now a renaissance of Satanic thought. What has been bubbling underground like a volcano for these past 20 years is now bursting forth. And the effect on the world is going to be overwhelming, really. How long personally have you had, let's say, a satanic consciousness? Ever since I was born and perhaps before that. Which, you know, you'd have to define what a satanic consciousness is. I do not worship an anthropomorphic deity named Satan. I don't worship a, a, some sort of character in the infernal regions with horns on his head and a tail. It's much more mysterious than that. Is We worship ourselves. We are the only gods in the universe. We create our own reality. And that force, that force in nature, has been misunderstood as evil. But there is no good and evil, and intelligent people understand that. And we're only interested in gathering intelligent people together for the conquest and betterment of a new world. Explain, though, some of these symbols around us here. Well, this is Baphomet, who is one of the traditional representations of the satanic entity. Above, on the, this black and white circle, is the symbol of the Church of Satan. And I think some people may be familiar with the swastika, which is the symbol of the Black Order in Germany, which was pretty much brought into use by the Thule Society, Guido von List, and the Armenian, who were very much inspirations to our work. And I think it's important to recognize National Socialism as one of the few times in the 20th century that humanity's full potential has been unleashed. The predatory instinct, the beast in man, was fully unleashed in that period. And I think since 1945, we've seen the decline of ethics, of values, of knightliness, of order in the world, and that will continue until now, because it's going to change. Because there's too many people of like mind, kindred spirits to ourselves, who are prepared to wage war on corruption and weakness and decadence. How do you respond to the attacks from other organizations and what have you towards yours? Um, is that something that concerns you? I, I react to it with contempt and amusement in equal measure. Um, yeah, I, I don't really care what other people think of our work because we, we hold them in such low esteem it could never be something we would give thought. 
We have no concern for the masses, and as I said, that's why these people are so misguided in their fears that we want to have anything to do with them. A perfect world to us would not include most of these people that are so frightened of us. And perhaps our philosophy ultimately will lead to their removal, but in a way that they'll never understand. What's going to hit them is going to hit them so hard that they'll never know what hit them. Aside from your music, what other means are you using to communicate to well, Radio Werewolf is really a communications empire. Radio Werewolf was the name of the last broadcasting station in the Third Reich. And in that sense, we are returning to that spirit and we're broadcasting the way of the wolf to the entire world through film, through literature, through music, through every medium. Tell me about the literature. Well, I've recently published The Manson File, which is probably the first objective portrait of Charles Manson, who is one of the more important thinkers of the 20th century and has previously been dismissed as a madman or a psychopath. And this is the beginning of a huge revisionist project that will continue until we reclaim history as our own and take it out of the hands of the slaves and the weak. Mention that Manson brought us together. Yeah, that's, 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 that is worth it. Okay. Um, the Abraxas Foundation, which Boyd Rice and myself pretty much founded, was brought about by a series of coincidences and events that have been to us a proof of our destiny. Um, we were both corresponding with Charles Manson, and basically it was Manson who introduced us. So our work certainly continues his legacy to a degree. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to be also releasing on Feral House um, a book entitled The Demonic Revolution, which will be the first book to fully summarize from a satanic point of view what's going on in the world today what this unleashing of demonic activity is really all about. The return to order, the return to authoritarianism, the return to traditional aesthetics, returning to the old world, the ancient world, the primeval world. And it's much needed because most of what you people in the media have portrayed has been lies, frankly, it's been lies. And you exploit the fear of human beings to make profits, which is a natural instinct but it's time to tell the truth about all these things and of course the truth frightens people mm -hmm. how many how do you see the world changing let's say in the next 20 years from your perspective it's going to be moving so fast that as i said the average human being is not going to be able to comprehend what's going on around them we're seizing control of the media we have scientists working for us we have people in every field intelligent competent ambitious people who have no guilt, who have no shame, and who have removed the filthiness of the Judeo-Christian ethic from their entire lifestyle. And when that happens, the power that is released from that, it's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a little voiceover for the ceremony we saw this evening, what that represents? Certainly. What it meant to you? Okay. Um, 8888, an evening of apocalyptic delights, was very deliberately designed as a ceremony and a ritual to celebrate the death of the 60s, for one thing. The Sharon Tate murder was a symbolic representation of the end of an entire way of thought, of compassion for the weak, peace for its own sake, pacifism that breeds stagnation, that entire way of thinking was finally destroyed on August 8th and 9th, 1969. And that is why we chose this evening to perform a ritual of cleansing and of purification. And it also is symbolic of the unholy alliance of various satanic entities in the world. Radio Werewolf, Non, the Church of Satan, and the work that Adam Parfrey has been doing. All of these things are coming together into what I've termed the demonic revolution. And it's going to continue in ways that will surprise people because what the, the mediocre mind perceives as Satanism has very little to do with Satanism. Mm -hmm. Heavy metal music, 
drug abuse, the sacrifice of children and animals. All of this is a smokescreen that the media has created abusing people's Christian processed fears. And Satanism, occultism, paganism, all of this is going to bring the 21st century into a truly demonic way of life. Mm -hmm. What is a demonic way of life? Well, the daemon, as it was defined by Plato, was the the true part of man, the real part of man, the authentic part of man. It isn't the Christian bugaboo, it isn't something that lives in hell. It's right here with us right now. It's energy, it's fire, it's the spirit that makes life worth living. And most people today don't have it. They absolutely don't have it. We see people who are adventurous, and to most people adventure is considered evil. Anything that is not given to them. Anything that's not part of their assembly line lifestyle is considered evil. So in that sense, perhaps we do represent evil. Mm -hmm. Is there an absence of guilt, though, in the... Absolutely. Guilt is part of the Judeo-Christian value system, and we reject it completely. And the fact is, we cannot teach others to reject the Judeo-Christian system. People are born this way. It's part of genetics. It's part of our destiny. There's a certain small elite, a different breed of human being that has really little to do with humanity as a whole. And this sort of thing has been misunderstood through the centuries as vampirism, lycanthropy. All these traditions are really real recognitions of the potential of mankind. It's the next step in evolution, and that's what we're bringing about. Okay. Again, describe the apocalypse from your perspective. Well, the apocalypse, of course, is a Christian term that derives from the Bible. So really, I have to say, semantically, the apocalypse means nothing to me. The world already ended, but we are now undergoing the final death of a certain way of life. The human life wave is being destroyed. It's destroying itself. It's destroying the earth that it lives on, and people are living in a trance. They're somnambulists. They literally are brainwashed, and I don't mean to use the word in a cliched phrase. They cannot think for themselves any longer. The television thinks for them. The television is thinking for them right now. They can't break away from that conditioning, and they never will. And they're going to destroy themselves. And we celebrate that destruction. We revel in that destruction, because at last, it means that the world is going to be the way we want it to be. We are recreating reality, and we're recreating it in our own image. So we're very joyful at the prospect of what you would term the apocalypse. If Armageddon is coming, then we welcome it with open arms. A bloodbath would be a cleansing and a purification of a planet that has been dirtied and degraded for too long. Mm -hmm. Not that you probably speculate on why they say this, but why do you think that the fundamentalists, so to speak, are ranting and raving about the apocalypse? Because I think any wounded creature that's in its last gasps rants and raves. I mean, a wild dog that you'll eventually have to shoot rants and raves and foams at the mouth. And that's basically what these evangelists are. Christianity isn't even worth discussing. It's a dead issue. It's beating the deadest of horses. Christianity is not a vital or living force in the world anymore. And this next millennium is really going to be a satanic millennium, if you prefer to use that terminology. But to move to a higher form of understanding, it needs no terminology at all. Because those who are part of it understand it in their blood. And the blood is where real understanding comes from. It isn't an intellectual process. In fact, the intellect is a crippling thing. And we don't represent the intellect or dry academia. We represent vital existence, and that is the predatory existence, and that's what, again, is considered evil. That's what's condemned as villainous or devilish. And we are very proud of the villains in human history, because almost universally, everyone that's been considered a villain is a hero, is someone who has broken away from the mold of mediocrity, and with a vision of a new world, created the steps towards the new world that is finally dawning. It is a new order that we are bringing about. And we could go centuries back and find those people from the Paleozoic age to today 
and it's always been a very small percentage it's never been many but these are the people who really create reality mm -hmm. can you name some of the greats that have um, persuaded this order in some way I think um, Friedrich Nietzsche is one of the great thinkers of our time, Charles Manson certainly, Adolf Hitler, the list goes on and on. They're, and also I wouldn't want to encourage the worship of these heroes because true Satanists, true workers of an occult path need not to worship anyone. A true leader, a true leader doesn't need anything except himself. So we don't look back to history and revere it. It is a nostalgic movement. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. I appreciate the interview. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, just for the first thing off the top, just um, tell me your name who you were with this. Okay, my name is Adam Parfrey. I'm a publisher, uh, editor, writer, uh, marketer, merchandiser, publicist. Um, with currently with Amok Press and forming a new press, which is uh, uh, quite satanic in nature, called Feral House, as in wild, untamed. Um, that's starting next year in 1989. And one of our first books will be a reissue of The Complete Witch by Anton LaVey, uh, which is something that's been out of print for quite some time. In its original form, it was uh, censored by uh, the publishing house for being too much, too, having too much information that could be construed as being uh, too savage, too dangerous for the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to get dangerous information out into the world. I think it's necessary for people to make up their own minds rather than some, some publishing house saying what, what's right and what's not. Mm -hmm. They can hang the phone up, I guess. Okay, continue that thought. Huh? Okay. Well, I, I don't really think it's, it's up to... Uh, Warner Books or Dodd Mead or the other large publishers to decide what's right for the public to consume. And in uh, republishing works by Anton LaVey, like The Complete Witch, which will be occurring in the fall of 18, 1989, uh, I'm able to get out this information uncensored to the, public, to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of people are you trying to get to? I'm trying to get to people who would respond uh, to the kind of uh, philosophy we're putting out. People who don't see anything out in the world right now feel lost, feel unattached, feel swirling in a, in a world of despair and boredom and uh, seeing something, seeing some glimmer of hope that, uh, that at last uh, there's some people like-minded and it's possible to put information out like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell me a little bit, too, just for uh, the audience who may know nothing about the Abraxas Foundation? Okay. Well, the Abraxas Foundation, as uh, Boyd Rice uh, told you, is a, is a fascist think tank, much like the Rand Corporation. Uh, we are out in the world. There are many important people in, in business and in science. Uh, it's not a membership organization. It's people who... Uh, seem to have found themselves as water seeks its own level and uh, we're, we're just uh, constructing the vessel in which the water <laughs> uh, fills the glass. Mm -hmm. Has business been good lately? Yes, business has been very good. Uh, Apocalypse Culture is now its third printing. Uh, we have a book out that's edited by Nicholas Schreck called The Manson File, which is uh, undiluted uh, statements by Charles Manson, which hasn't occurred. Uh, people usually feel his thoughts too crazy, too non-linear, uh, but the book we put out uh, didn't censor him, so it was something that uh, reached the public uh, in a more pure form. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been personally involved with Satan worship? Well, I don't worship uh, anything called Satan with the mm -hmm. hooves and so on. It's, a, it's more a philosophical thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an understanding of power. Mm -hmm. It's a clear understanding of power and how it operates in the world. Mm -hmm. It's, well, 
Um, the the non-Satanist uh, is someone who's always confused and mixed up in the world of illusions. They'll be watching television, and it's sort of like the Carney act. Uh, someone's like pounding the table while they're shuffling the cards underneath the the, the table. It's like a Carney game. It's uh, what's happening is is that they're being set up to uh, be automatons and to be good consumers. Um, I I against that world of illusion and if people can see what's really happening getting pure information out there which is what I set out to do then I think there's at least a chance or more of a chance to uh, change the world in a, in, a, in a good way I remember Manson said that to uh, he said you live in a thousand illusions he was upset that uh, people would, would think that way um, what are your basic ideas that you try to get out to uh, people off the bat what are the first well, things that they tend to to grasp onto. Basic, the basic idea is, is to uh, show the world in an unvarnished form. If there is an apocalypse, as there is currently, to, to not to sweeten things over with uh, saccharine verses and uh, glad-handing people with L.A. law and soporific nonsense, you know, it's to show the, what's really occurring. And uh, that's that's all I'm doing. I'm, it's it's basically a reflection of of what's uh, what's powerful and real. Describe the apocalypse. The apocalypse um, has occurred years ago. It occurred at, at the fall at Stalingrad. Uh, what happened in 1945 when uh, the Germans lost the war? It was really a civil war between white people and white people have been feeling guilty about themselves ever since. They, they, they feel that they have to bend over backwards to, uh, to create a comfortable life for the rest of the world and they've forgotten about themselves. They should listen to the words of Spengler. <laughs> I mean, most people uh, perceive the apocalypse as something out of the book of Revelations and yes. that sort of thing. And yes. How is that? Uh, you obviously don't see it in that, that light. That's true. I, I'm not a you know Bible believer. Um, it's it's strange and remarkable the coincidental uh, things of the aspects between the, the the New Testament and what is occurring because. Uh, it, well, uh, it wasn't pointed out in the New Testament that at the second millennium, that's a, basically been a church construct to make people fear. It's, I think that's maybe another illusion, but what we have in the world is severe overpopulation and horrible ecological failure. And all this, uh, all this apocalypse, all this uh, Malthusian uh, uh, mud flood we have out there is... Uh, indicative of the apocalyptic you know I, I mean all you have to do is open up your eyes you don't have to read the Bible to see it mm -hmm. what do you say to your critics who probably consider you evil and damaging mm -hmm. and that sort of thing to well uh, they can consider me evil I don't consider myself evil I consider myself a, a source of pure information uh, I don't consider myself an illusionist uh, illusionists are evil people who block information and uh, since I give out information I, I feel that I'm doing uh, I'm, I'm not a Christian reformer or anything but I, I do feel that I'm providing a service mm -hmm. alright Malcolm no, um, <clears throat> do you have any enemies out there? Are there people that uh, you feel threatened by? Well, my only enemies are people who are trying to thwart me in uh, terms of uh, what I do, who, who feel that I'm some sort of threat and try to stop me. Um, those are enemies. As for the rest, I have no feeling whatsoever. Are there any specific individuals or, or organizations though? That... Uh, I can't discuss that. Okay. But they exist? I think so. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. we didn't cover. Oh, well, um, <laughs> perhaps you should reflect on the, the books that are going to be occurring in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a sequel to this apocalypse culture. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have written me from all over the world really responding to this notion. They said, my God, there is an apocalypse out there and no one's really saying it. They see this thing and they respond to it. It resonates within themselves. And, they, and uh, so it's a, it's a growing thing and there's a, a, quite a demand for it. So. Uh, very unusual household. Yes, definitely. <laughs>
Are you testing for sound? Yes. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, okay Zena, tell us your name and whose daughter you are. My name is Zena LaVey, and I am Anton LaVey's daughter, who is the founder and high priest of the Church of Satan, uh, the first Church of Satan. Uh, was there any doubt in your life that you'd be anything other than a Satanist yourself? Well, at one point, uh, I tried to live what I consider to be a normal life for a period of about three years. And um, I moved to another town where no one knew who I was. And I gave it a shot, and I was literally miserable. I, I was almost suicidal because of the mainstream uh, mentality that ran through this town was just more torture than I could ever imagine. What factors made you decide to try to get out and change your life? Well, you figure, you know, you can try everything or try anything once. And um, so I, it was just a morbid curiosity, I guess. Was, was your father very upset with you when you did that? No, not at all. Um, that's one uh, area where we differ in our child rearing. Um, we realize that children are going to experiment in different philosophies, lifestyles, what have you, and uh, we feel that it's important to allow that natural process rather than trying to stifle it. So where uh, some parents may uh, you know, be uh, terrified of their kids becoming involved in drugs or what have you. Uh, maybe if they sort of loosened the reins and said, okay, we know that you're going to be doing this, but, uh, you know, like with my parents, they said, if you're going to experiment with drugs, please do it under our roof so that if anything happens, we can help you. Subsequently, uh, there was very little drug, drug experimentation. Uh, likewise, I had a child when I was 14 um, that I was allowed to keep and raise on my own. And I seriously don't know how many other parents would allow a 13-year-old, a pregnant 13-year-old, to make the decision to keep her child and, and raise it rather than having an abortion or giving it up for adoption. Your child is how old now? Uh, right now he's 10. And he still lives with you? Yes. And you, you live where? Do you, do you live with your dad? Or no, I live in Los Angeles and uh, I live, my son and myself live on our own. What was it like as a child with your father? Um, I mean, back to school nights, that sort of thing. Just growing up. Back to school nights, well, uh, growing up in the type of environment that I was in was quite a bit different from the average environment. I was exposed to a wide variety of personalities, a wide variety of um, uh, classes, everything from um, very, uh, very street mentality to duchesses. Did the other kids pick on you at school? At the definitely, the definitely. Yes. Um, so that was uh, one thing that was rather eye-opening to me, the fact that if you're considered the slightest bit out of the norm or different, it wasn't only me, it was any other child that was considered different, um, was picked on ruthlessly. And at a very early age, I realized that there had to be a stop to that type of thing. Are all your friends now in the same church as you? Or do you have friends outside? I can say that all of my closest friends are of the satanic philosophy, yes. Describe in your words what the satanic philosophy means. Well, satanic philosophy, it's an alternative not only to um, the... Mm -hmm. okay, we're talking about what, is Satan, <laughs> what does Satan mean to you? It represents an alternative. Satanism represents an alternative not only to the fundamental religions, but an alternative to mass thought, what we term herd mentality, um, the uh, masses that'll just go with something because the person that's next to them happens to be doing the same thing and it's safe and it's secure. Um, we 
we find our security in other things and uh, whether it's listening simply listening to a different type of music or whether it's uh, appreciating a different art form we find our own standards if you will and our own morals and we live by those morals religiously and they're uh, what we consider to be just and true for us you sound like you were brought up in a very loving home did, did you feel that way Yes, I feel I was raised uh, in a very caring environment uh, where I was concerned. Um, yes, I can say I was. Children, that's a popular misconception too, is that children are sacrificed at the altar, that uh, animals are used for uh, sacrifices. And it's a horrible, horrible misconception. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, I, I can honestly say that probably my best friends are my pets. Um, why would I want to kill them? <laughs> it's absolutely beyond me uh, how people can think we would do that. Is it a misconception? that uh, sex and pain go relatively hand in hand? Well, sure. sex and pain, that's... Everyone has their own sexual preferences, and that's up to the individual. I mean, we advocate free sense, uh, free rather free sex, in the sense that you're free to partake in whatever sexual activity is most pleasurable to you, um, so long as it doesn't hurt anyone else that isn't of the same thinking. Um, if, if even if that means masturbation completely, that if that's what's most pleasurable to you, then so be it. But that's completely left up to the individual. What about the public uh, conception of satanic orgies? Is that all total bullshit? Or well, from my experiences, it's bullshit. I mean, I'm sure there are orgies. Uh, if they have them in the White House, they might as well. <laughs> uh, I've never witnessed any orgies. Okay. Is there anything you would like to add? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it.